looked at conductors and insulators and we've seen that it's the energy bands that describe the behavior of conductors and insulators. A quick recap of what we've seen so far. <clears throat> On the vertical axis, I'm plotting energy. First of all, I would like to draw the diagram of a conductor and then an insulator. And in the end, I'll draw, draw the diagram for a semiconductor. I have already given you enough motivation of why and how energy bands are formed. In a conductor, we have a band that is called the valence band, which comprises the electrons that are still bound to the atomic nuclei which belong to the core of the atoms. They are not free to move. And we have a conduction band. And there is a gap. There could be a gap between the valence band and the conduction band. And these bands are formed when atoms come close together in a solid. Their energy levels split apart. They fan out. And they form a, an almost continuum of levels. Although it's not really a continuum, but the levels are spaced so close together that it appears to form a band, it appears to form a continuum. In a conductor what we have is this topmost level which is let's call it vacuum. This is where an electron can be ejected from the atom and it becomes free. For example in a photoelectric effect you have electrons inside a metal, you shine light on it and if the incident energy exceeds the work function the electron can be ejected and it becomes free. So this is the vacuum level. Now in a conductor the valence band is completely filled. So this band is completely filled. There are electrons throughout the band and if you look close enough, this band comprises finely spaced levels and each level has two electrons because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And the energy keeps on increasing. There are no levels inside the gap. And the conduction band comprises free electrons that do not belong to any atom. They have lost their identity. They are wanderers in, inside the metal. They belong to the sea of electrons. And they contribute to conduction. And this conduction band what happens in, in the conduction band in the conductor? Is it completely filled? Is it empty? Partially. It's partially filled. It has to be partially filled because when you apply an electric field, the electrons that are present at the Fermi level, these electrons, they should have available to them vacant levels to which they can make transitions and this is how conduction takes place and elect if you apply an electric field this electron at the Fermi level can jump to a higher level because the level is empty if the higher levels were filled the electrons in the higher levels would impede or they would obstruct incoming electrons because of the Pauli exclusion principle that is why in a conductor we have a partially filled conduction band. And this topmost level is called the Fermi level. So the Fermi level can be defined in metals as the highest filled energy level or the level above which there are no filled levels. So this is the picture for a conductor. For an insulator this gap EG is large. For example, in diamond, it's about 6 electron volts. It's a large gap. 
and what happens in an insulator what about the energy level structure of an insulator can anyone tell me I've already explained it what happens about the filling of the electrons right the valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is totally empty and these electrons that are at the top of the valence band they have to surmount this barrier they have to cross a large gap so that they can start conducting and if you apply a very strong electric field or you have some kind of excitation that can overcome this gap the insulator will break down that is called the dielectric breakdown but in an insulator the conduction band is completely empty and the valence band is completely filled so the top of the valence band is generally has an energy denoted by EV and the bottom of the valence band uh, conduction band has an energy called EC the bottom of the conduction band the top of the valence band now these are pictures the energy band structure of a conductor and for an insulator an insulator does not conduct because even if you apply a modest electric field the this electron that is at the top of the valence band does not have another neighboring level to which it can make a transition because in quantum mechanics you have to make transitions the energy can only increase in discrete steps so this electron cannot does not have any neighboring level it's surrounded it's in an island which is surrounded by sea everywhere and it cannot move on to another island unless it can make a giant leap and cross the sea and go on to another island so this electron cannot make an upward tr transition in energy so this is the picture for an insulator now in between we have objects or materials that are called semiconductors and first of all I would like to talk about what are called pure or intrinsic semiconductors <clears throat> so there is a once again we have a valence band and a conduction band and let's draw the picture at zero kelvins and no thermal energy is present this semiconductor is at zero kelvins absolute zero temperature again this valence band is completely filled and this gap eg exists which is smaller than an insulator is generally one of the order of one electron volt for germanium it's about 0.6 electron volts and for silicon it's about 1.1 electron volt germanium and silicon are typical metals in the group 4 of the periodic table which qualify as semiconductors so this gap is small as compared to an insulator but the gap nevertheless exists and the valence band is completely filled and the conduction band is totally empty so there are electrons in the valence band and the conduction band is totally empty so this is the band structure of a semiconductor how is this different from an insulator first the gap is very small the gap is very small so an ins if you can engineer this band gap it's a field called quantum engineering or band gap engineering in which you can change the band gap if this band gap can be made smaller and smaller so that you reach this energy spacing of about an electron volt you will get a semiconductor now this is the band structure now let's draw a diagram that represents the silicon crystal structure and a very naive diagram so it, but we would like to make this diagram so that we understand it better okay band gap ki some some band diagram ki let's draw a silicon structure silicon has 
an atomic number of 14 which is 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p2 4 10 so in the valence shell in the k L M shell there are four electrons so it has four valence electrons and it can bond with four neighboring silicon atoms making covalent bonds so if I plot the silicon structure schematically on two dimensions this is what the structure will look like I have silicon cores which comprise the K shell and the L shell that is the valence electrons So now, <clears throat> now each silicon atom has four valence electrons, each one of them. So it can bond with four neighbor, neighboring silicon atoms. So there's an electron here. I am drawing this structure on two dimensions. In fact, the structure, of course, is three dimensional, and the silicon forms tetrahedral bonds just like diamond. So, it is a three dimensional structure, but for purposes of pedagogical purposes, for illustration, this is what I am drawing a silicon atom coordinated by four neighboring silicon atoms and sharing the four electrons. All the four electrons are being shared with neighbors and they form covalent bonds. And all of these electrons they belong to the valence band they are not free for conduction at zero kelvins because they contribute to the bonding however this particular electron does this electron belong to this silicon atom no it doesn't this electron could belong to the neighboring silicon atom as well but this is nevertheless st the structure so now what happens as you increase the temperature that is the temperature goes above 0 Kelvin now when the temperature goes above 0 Kelvin and you reach a temperature when the thermal energy exceeds this gap when the thermal energy exceeds this gap, an electron in the valence band now has enough energy to be promoted to the conduction band. When this electron is promoted to the conduction band, this electron goes here into the conduction band because now it has been given a kick by the thermal energy so that it jumps this gap it jumps the gap and when it jumps the gap a vacancy is created in the topmost level of the valence band when this vacancy is created I represent this vacancy by an empty circle now an electron has gone into the conduction band and concomitantly or at the same time a vacancy has been created in the valence band this vacancy is given a special name and it's called a hole. So an electron that goes into the conduction band creates a hole in the valence band by thermal energy. 
this is process is called electron hole generation and how have we achieved this generation with the help of thermal energy so this is thermally activated electron hole pairs and if you look on this diagram what has happened is that a particular electron has become free it is now free to wander inside the crystal and it has created a vacancy this vacancy is represented by an empty circle it's called a hole now if you look at this structure at this in this region do we maintain electrical neutrality is this region electrically neutral no it's not this region becomes positively charged because an electron has gone missing it is within the crystal but locally it, it acquires a charge agreed now when this charge has been created you can consider this to be a nucleus and this is an electron now an electron is orbiting a nucleus this is just like the bohr's atom an electron revolving or an electron orbiting a nucleus but the important fact is that an electron hole pair has been generated now what happens if in this structure you apply an electric field you apply an electric field in the rightwards direction this particular electron that has now been freed this electron that has now been freed will move under the action of this electric field and will contribute to conduction and this is the direction in which it will experience a force so this electron that is now has become freed from the crystalline structure it's still inside the crystal but it's not contributing to bonding has become a conduction electron and it can contribute to conduction but what about the hole now since this is now a vacancy inside inside the bonds there is a vacancy inside the bond this is positively charged it can attract a neighboring electron so a neighboring electron inside the bond can be attracted towards this positive charge and what happens is an electron inside the valence band can take its place and when it takes its place the electron comes here and a vacancy is created here this electron a neighboring electron can jump and take the place of this hole so this vacancy is filled but a vacancy is created is created here so electrons are moving towards the left under the action of the applied field and one can imagine that holes are moving towards the right so there is a motion of the electrons in the conduction band against the direction of the electric field and there is a corresponding motion of the holes in the direction of the electric field and the holes are moving inside the valence band they're not moving inside the conduction band the electrons that have been freed they are moving inside the conduction band and the holes that remain within the bonding network they are moving inside the valence band now the electrons of course they can be they contribute to electrical current and the holes they can also be treated as particles that are contributing towards current so in a semiconductor it's not only the electrons that contribute to the current it's also the holes both of them are charge carriers so the electrons are charge carriers and the holes are charge carriers and the total current density is 
due to the holes uh, due to the electrons n e where n is the number of electrons per unit volume uh, the charge on an electron and the drift velocity of the electrons plus the charge on a hole what's the charge on a hole it's the same as the charge on an electron n h which is which is the concentration of holes per unit volume and is n h the same as n e yes it is because it's a pure semiconductor as many holes as there are electrons and the drift velocity of the holes and the drift velocity of the holes are different from the drift velocity of the electrons because the electrons are moving in the conduction band and the holes are moving in the valence band so the holes can be treated like anti electrons they are they can be treated like particles which have a positive charge the same charge as an electron but they exist inside the valence band so they can be electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band can be treated on equal footings why is there so much commotion there ah dekho kya ho gaya kuch pareshani hai okay so it's a tricky concept so please pay attention so now what we have actually achieved inside a semiconductor is that electrons are promoted to the conduction band and when they are promoted to the conduction band they contribute to conduction and they leave holes in their wake when they leave holes in their wake holes piche chhod jate hain holes can move inside the valence band so they are charge carriers holes are charge carriers they are current they contribute to current and electrons are also charge carriers when they are inside the conduction band and if you keep on increasing the thermal energy then you can get more and more electrons in the conduction band <coughs> and you can get more and more holes in the valence band whenever you promote an electron from the valence band to the conduction band you get charge carriers in the conduction band and charge carriers in the valence band and remember that this act of promotion takes place near the fermi level at the edge of the valence band and the conduction band the electrons that are down below do not contribute to conduction as is classically the case so all electrons are not the same some electrons are more useful in contributing to conduction those electrons which are at the edge of the band because they have free levels to which they can make a transition I will answer your question, but in a minute. ठीक है? So this is thermally generated electron hole, electron hole pairs. But you can also have other mechanisms. Can anyone think of a mechanism? So one mechanism is thermal. Application of an electric field. All right. A student has remarked that you apply a very strong electric field so that this electron can cross this barrier and jump into the conduction band. Okay. This is one method. This is called the field emission effect. But it happens in rare cases. Anything else? Magnetic force. Anything else? doping is something for pure semiconductors when you performed an experiment in the freshman physics laboratory you were using a silicon photo detector light. you throw light on a semiconductor you can throw light on a semiconductor which means that if you have a photon that is coming in with a frequency omega and this energy h bar omega exceeds or is equal to the energy gap you can promote an electron from the valence band into the conduction band and when you promote an electron of course you will get an electron here and you will form a corresponding hole in the valence band so electron hole pairs can also be generated by light you put you shine light on it and the frequency of the photon is such that the energy is greater than the energy gap electron hole pairs will be generated 
This is how a solar cell roughly works. You shine light on it, you generate electron hole pairs and the conduction increases. You put it inside a circuit, you can measure current. So, and a third mechanism is through light. But the photon has to be of the correct frequency. Photons, if you shine light, a very intense light source, a large number of photons that do not have the correct frequency or whose frequency is smaller than this gap, no matter how many photons you shine onto the semiconductor, electron hole pairs will not be generated. Just like the photoelectric effect. So you really have to have the correct frequency. There's a minimum frequency or a maximum cutoff wavelength that is required in order to generate electron hole pairs. Another mechanism, a fourth mechanism that is sometimes obscured from our attention. Obscured, yani kabhi hum bhool jate hain usko. Wo ye hai ke at temperatures greater than zero Kelvin, these silicon atoms are not fixed in their position. They are vibrating. They are vibrating. And when the silicon atom vibrates, for example, if this silicon atom vibrates and it comes into this position, and this silicon atom vibrates and it comes into this position so that the bond length increases. When the bond length increases, these electrons can pick up enough energy. They can pick up enough energy so that they, are, they get freed from the bond. Deco. The distance between, if this bond stretches, if a bond stretches, now you have the energy of the electron changes because the nuclei are further apart. When the nuclei are further apart, this electron may get a kick in its energy. Its energy may increase. When its energy increases, because the potential energy of this electron is going up, because the nucleus is now further away. So is this caused by a mechanical force or...? Right, okay, I'll let you know. So this elect the energy of this electron may increase. And if the energy of this electron increases, in, uh, goes beyond the bonding energy, then it becomes free. Is a cert Every bond has a certain bond energy associated with it. The electron, if the electron has an energy higher than the bond energy, the electron cannot remain inside the bond. So this electron can be freed because of this stretching of the bond. And why does this stretching take place? It's a mechanical effect. You increase the temperature, these silicon atoms start shivering. You increase the temperature, they start moving, they start jostling around because of the energy that is given to the silicon atoms. The silicon atoms start vibrating because you're giving them energy. And when they, you give them energy, these bonds can become distorted. These bonds can stretch, they can compress. And as a result, electrons can be ejected. So the fourth mechanism is through thermal vibrations. So all of these mechanisms lead to electron hole generation. And when you have electron hole generation, you get conductivity. G. Thermally excited electrons. Yeah, thermally excited electrons. So this is when the electrons gain enough energy. See, you're giving energy to the electrons even if the silicon atoms remain where they are. And this is when the silicon atoms are moving. Remember, silicon is present in the Earth's crust. All of sand is silicon dioxide. So it's a very abundant metal. Uh, element. About 25% of the earth's crust is silicon. <coughs> but <coughs> silicon is also <coughs> excuse me, the purest element known to mankind. Because as a result of crystal growing techniques when you make, a, when you make an integrated circuit or you make a microelectronic device, the silicon if you're using a pure uh, uh, semiconductor it has to be exceptionally pure. Which means that there can only be at the most one impurity atom in 10 raised power 8 to 10 raised power 10 atoms. That is you have 10 billion atoms of silicon. A very neat, perfect, orderly structure. And then you might have an impurity atom. Gold 
argon, titanium, zinc. So silicon is the purest known element to mankind and it naturally occurring silicon is not pure but because of the electronics industry we have been able to make exceptionally pure silicon or and germanium. Now the question I would like to ask is if on one axis I have the temperature and on the other axis I have the resistivity. For metals we know that the resistivity increases linearly with temperature and classically it is predicted this is the classical prediction which is flawed which predicts that the resistivity goes as the square root of temperature but experimentally this is what we observe a linear relationship between the resistivity and temperature but what about semiconductors what do you expect in semiconductors so in between if you increase the temperature what should happen to the resistivity it should decrease so semiconductors show the opposite behavior from metals for a semiconductor roughly the resistivity drops as the temperature increases the lady sitting at the back could you tell me why why does the resistivity drop as the temperature increases the flow of electrons there are more holes any more accurate answer aap batai ji green shirt mein aap tai ji ji right because as the temperature goes up more and more electrons in the valence band are able to make this jump and when they are able to make this jump they become they enter the conduction band they are now free to move inside the crystal and correspondingly more holes are formed as many electrons so many holes because it's a pure semiconductor so these electrons contribute to conduction which are now freed which have crossed this gap and there are holes available in the conduction in the valence band and they contribute to conduction so in semiconductors as the temperature goes up the resistivity drops and it's exactly the opposite behavior from metals and it is the band gap diagram that explains this fact it's a purely quantum me mechanical result you cannot explain the band gap using classical results there was a question which a student was asking ji when you have a copper wire and current is flowing through a copper wire it is the electrons that are contributing to the current conventional current means you can consider this to be positive charges you take either the positive charges or the negative charges but in semiconductors there are electrons that are contributing to the current in their own right and there are holes that are contributing to the current in their own right both of them are charge carriers both of them contribute to current वहां पे एब्सेंस ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन पॉजिटिव चार्ज नहीं होता वो एक न्यूट्रल वो इलेक्ट्रॉन्स हैं जो कंट्रीब्यूट कर रहे हैं करंट को ठीक है वहां पे तो होल्स नहीं है प्लीज आस्क क्लाउड सो दैट एवरीवन कैन लिसन सो यू हैव एक्सप्लेन दैट दिस इज अ प्योरली क्वांटम मैकेनिकल कांसेप्ट द फिलिंग द मूविंग ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉन्स फ्रॉम द वैलेंस बैंड टू द कंडक्टर्स बैंड but uh, when you use the term a uh, hole is created or the electron comes out of the hole so would it not be treating it like more of a particle than a wave all right so this student has asked a very interesting question that now we are we are treating the electron as particle and the hole as particle indeed when we say that there's a hole here an electron comes and fills its position we are treating the hole and the electron as particles but this is one that's why i said this is a naive approach it's a simplistic approach do not take it too literally what actually is happening is that there are electrons in this valence band and they have a wave function 
and their wave function spreads throughout the solid their wave function is not localized it is spread throughout the solid and what happens is that if there is a hole here and an electron here or there is a hole here and an electron here this silicon atom presents an energy gap or it presents a potential well so now this electron sees a potential well it has a wave function it sees a potential well it has to tunnel through this well and reach the hole so it is quantum mechanical tunneling that is making the electrons move inside the network of bonds and you always have these potential wells at the sides of the silicon atoms so electrons are tunneling in between this maze or labyrinth of potential wells so really what is happening is a quantum mechanical phenomenon but for simplistic purposes and for pedagogical reasons just to explain i'm treating the electrons and holes as particles and the results which come out by treating the electrons and holes as particles they hold true they they are they hold weight they they are correct results because we have used the quantum mechanical energy band diagram to postulate to present the idea that electrons and holes exist so you can treat the holes as particles the only thing is that the holes will have a certain mass what mass to use for the holes electrons we know have a mass but so the mass of an electron when it is in vacuum is 1.6 uh, 9.1 into 10 to the power minus 31 kg but when an electron is inside a conduction band it has a different mass and the hole will also have a mass it's called an effective mass so you start you can deal with electrons and holes in semiconductors as particles but with different masses from their originals but this is beyond the scope and if you take a course on semiconductor physics this is something that you will learn all right so we discussed uh, electron hole pair generation in pure semiconductors one effect i would like to mention <coughs> if there is an electron here in the conduction band and a hole in the valence band this is an excited state another phenomenon that can happen is that this electron falls back into the valence band it falls back and this hole is filled filled up again and when this happens the electron and hole recombine so this process is called electron hole recombination upar to hole nahi banta na vacancy to pehle wahan pe hole ja hi nahi sakta conduction band mein conduction band mein sirf electron hoga so when this electron jumps back into the hole what will happen they will recombine and what where will the energy go photon. a photon will be emitted so a photon will be emitted of the correct frequency which is the energy gap this is how approximately how an led works a light emitting diode works electron hole recombination takes place and photons are emitted light is emitted but pn junctions and diodes will be discussed by dr abdi in, in the next class so let's move on to what we what we call extrinsic semiconductors so this graph means the resistivity increases with respect to time what about the uh, vibration of the uh, uh, silicon atoms so this we have resistivity increases with respect to dono effects combine karte hain theek hai और दोनों इफेक्ट्स को मिला के भी रेजिस्टिविटी डिक्रीजेस ठीक है वो भी इफेक्ट है टेम्परेचर द टेम्परेचर वुड लाइक टू इंक्रीज द लैटिस वाइब्रेशन बट टेम्परेचर वुड ऑल्सो लाइक टू इंक्रीज द कॉन्सेंट्रेशन ऑफ चार्ज कैडियर सो दे आर कॉम्पीटिंग इफेक्ट एंड बोथ ऑफ देव टू बी टेकन इन टू अकाउंट नो इट कैन एवर डिक्रीज टू जीरो बिकॉज यू ऑलवेज हैव दीज लैटिस वाइब्रेशन
Now let's talk about extrinsic semiconductors. <coughs> And the first example I would like to give from extrinsic semiconductors Suppose you take an, a phosphorus atom Phosphorus is in group 5 of the periodic table it has five valence electrons. Now again, it's very important to understand this properly. You have silicon atoms. You have a host of silicon atoms inside a matrix. And you have a phosphorus atom. So the phosphorus atom is now a foreign agent and you intentionally put in this impurity inside the pure semiconductor and you do not inundate it with the impurity that is you do not have something like brass which is 40% copper and 60% zinc for 10 raised power 8 silicon atoms you just have or 10 raised power 6 silicon atoms on average you just have one phosphorus atom. This is the level of control that you need in the semiconductor industry. You have 1 million silicon atoms and with 1 million silicon atoms you just have a phosphorus atom or an arsenic atom, something belonging to the group 5 of the periodic table. And what you really need to do is you have to choose an element whose atomic radius is almost the same as the silicon, as silicon. So that if you make a crystal structure, phosphorus does not have much difficulty in acting as a proxy for silicon. Yani, if you take a very big atom here, group 5 mein koi element which is very low, if you take a very big atom, then phosphorus will have difficulty in incorporating itself within the silicon host. So you need to take an atom which has an, a comparable atomic radius or ionic radius. So now what happens is that this silicon makes a bond with phosphorus. Exactly as if it, would, if it would make a bond with another silicon atom. So again this structure is formed. There are four electrons in the silicon that are contributing to bonding and four electrons in the phosphorus that is contributing to bonding. But where does the fifth electron in the phosphorus go? It becomes, it does not contribute to bonding. It does not contribute to bonding. Suppose I make this diagram at 0 Kelvin. What happens is that this fifth electron, since this phosphorus atom, this is a core of electrons and protons and neutrons is positively charged. And this electron is seeing a positively charged center. So this electron in very naive terms will start revolving around the phosphorus nucleus. So this will become a Bohr atom. This is just like a Bohr atom in which there is one electron and a central core of charge, some charge Z. <coughs> this is a hydrogen atom. This is a electron hai and there is a central core of positive charge. So this acts like a Bohr atom. And the energy of this electron becomes quantized. Because we know that the energy of an electron inside a Bohr atom is quantized. And the energy of this fifth electron is would simply be given by Or not, or not. Yes. 
because the energy is given by minus mass of the electron inside the metal E4 4 pi epsilon h bar squared z squared over n squared this is the energy of an electron that is orbiting that is inside a Bohr atom you take the mass of the electron here and here you have to take the permittivity of the material instead of taking the permittivity of free of free space you have to take the permittivity of silicon and you have to take an effective charge so you don't have to remember all of this but this is something that should ring a bell because you've already studied this and what really matters is that this electron will have a certain ionization energy that is you can give it energy so that this electron is freed so this electron will have a certain ionization energy now if you would like to make the energy diagram for this structure what would it look like Is the valence band completely filled? At zero kelvins, is the valence band completely filled? Yes, it is. The valence band is completely filled. Is the conduction band filled or empty? At zero kelvins. Is it partially filled? It's empty. At zero Kelvin, the conduction band is empty because there is no conduction electron that is available. The, this fifth electron in the phosphorus atom is bound to the phosphorus atom. It's not free. It's bound to the phosphorus atom. It's a bound system. So this is completely empty. And there's an energy gap. However, the fifth electron can become free. The fifth electron can become free. How can it become free? By gaining energy. How much energy? The ionization energy of this fifth electron in the phosphorus atom, which is the ionization energy. So, I can draw and this ionization energy is very small. It's about point 0 0.05 electron volt 50 milli electron volt now this gap is about 1 electron volt so where should I how should I modify this diagram in order to account for this fifth electron can you draw the energy level diagram for the fifth electron on this diagram where will I place the fifth electron at 0 kelvins the formula is E0 or E0? I'm just, look, 13.6 electron volt hydrogen atom I just wanted to replace E0 by the permittivity of the material which is E0 times the relative permittivity. gap ke barabar to nahi wo to 0 0.05 electron volt hai phosphorus se hum agar ek electron jiske char hai ek phosphorus ka fifth wale ke ki chances hai ki wo andar aa jaye aur uski wo the fifth electron it will have certain energy. Where is that energy on this energy band diagram? Half. 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 Half.
और वो पॉइंट जीरो फाइव इलेक्ट्रॉन वोल्ट नीचे होगी किधर होगी इसकी एनर्जी छोड़ दो इसको एनी वन I just would like to identify the energy of this fifth electron at zero Kelvin on this band diagram. But this fifth electron will have an energy somewhere. It could be in a gap. Kidder Ruby, Shamash. So this fifth electron, which is loosely bound to the phosphorus atom because of a very small ionization energy, can easily go into the conduction band by gaining the ionization energy. Which means that at zero Kelvin, this fifth electron will sit 0 0.05 electron volts below the conduction band. So a new energy level is formed, which is E ionization or 0 0.05 electron volts below the edge of the conduction band. If this electron somehow gains this ionization energy by temperature or by field emission or by a photon or by thermal vibrations, this fifth electron from the phosphorus atom can go into the conduction band and contribute to conduction and why have I drawn this energy level as a punctuated line that is the spaces between the lines in, instead of a continuous line uski wajah ye hai ki this phosphorus atom is only present at certain locations inside the crystal it's a localized level this this level is only present here then you will have to wait for another million atoms till you see another phosphorus atom and then and this level will only be present at localized at the phosphorus atom so these are localized energy levels but they are ionization and at an ionization energy below the edge of the conduction band so you give it slight energy if the energy exceeds this gap this electron will be promoted into the conduction band. This electron can be promoted into the conduction band. And will holes be formed? No holes will be formed. So you can promote all of these electrons into the conduction band. And no holes will be formed. So this type of material is called an N-type material. An n-type material because the charge carriers are electrons. There will always be holes because electron hole generation from the valence band to the conduction band is always taking place at the same time. This is always taking place. However, there is a larger fraction of n-type electrons. So this is called an n-type material. And the, this level that is formed is called ED or the donor level. Donor level. And the donor level because the, nit the phosphorus atom has denoted, donated an, an extra electron to contribute to conduction. So this is the structure for an N-type material. Now let's draw the converse.
The converse is a p-type material. Please, थोड़ा सा आराम से आराम से Now instead of a group 5 element in the periodic table, you take a group 3 element in the periodic table which has 3 electrons in the valence shell such as boron or aluminum. Aluminum is not uh, preferred but boron is the element of choice. So you have silicon, 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 boron. Now this boron atom has only three electrons. So there is naturally a hole exists here. So naturally a hole exists. So this is exactly the converse situation from this particular configuration. Here you have an excess electron that is bound to a positively charged center. What do you have here? You have an absence of an electron. So what you can consider is that you have a positively charged particle being attracted to a negative center. And this electron, this hole can be filled. And this hole can be filled by a neighboring electron taking up its position or this electron takes its position this electron takes its position but there is an ionization energy associated with this phenomenon as well so if you take this into account this atom will introduce an energy level which is here which is above the valence band by E ionization and this is filled with holes and there are electrons here the valence band of course is completely filled there are electrons here at zero kelvins you do not have any conduction However, if you increase the temperature, it is possible that an electron in the valence band, for example, an electron here, or an electron here, an electron here, electron here, sees this hole and jumps into the hole. So it can make this transition, which is a very small transition because this ionization gap is small. And when it makes this transition, this level becomes filled and a hole is created here. It makes this transition, this level becomes filled and a hole is created here inside the valence band. An electron makes the transition, jumps into here and this a hole is created here. So with the introduction of a slight amount of energy, holes can be injected into the valence band. It's exactly the converse of what is happening here. Electrons are injected into the conduction band because of the presence of a donor level just below the bottom of the conduction band. The 
converse situation occurs here there are these levels which are called which are denoted by ea or acceptor levels acceptor levels because there are holes at this level and these holes can accept electrons from the valence band so when an electron makes a jump from the valence band to the acceptor level these holes are filled and holes are created inside the valence band and we know that holes inside the valence band contribute to conduction so we get a large number of holes in the valence band this type of material is called a p type material I will finish and then I will answer your questions. I am sorry, we just have 5 minutes. I would like to finish something because we have another lecture on Wednesday which starts off from here. Okay, is this clear? So this is a small ionization energy and in a P-type material, the majority charge carriers are holes. Remember, there will always be electron hole generation due to thermal means. That is, an electron can always jump from this conduction valence band to the conduction band and form a hole, hole here at room temperature or at elevated temperatures but in this case for every electron in the conduction band there is a hole but in an extrinsic semiconductor there are more holes than there are free electrons agreed in an n-type material there are more electrons than there are holes so the charge mechanism in an n-type material is predominantly due to electrons and the charge mechanism in a p-type material is predominantly due to holes. Now what happens if <coughs> Okay, so we've seen the energy band diagrams for n and p-type materials. Question I would like to devote the last 5 to 10 minutes is the following. Now this is the diagram for a pure semiconductor, for an intrinsic semiconductor such as silicon or germanium and I have deliberately drawn the lines here just for a reason. Now where at 0 kelvins these levels are completely filled. Where is the Fermi level? The Fermi level is here. If we define the Fermi level as a level, there are two ways of defining the Fermi level as a level which corresponds to the highest occupied energy level at 0 Kelvin and this is the Fermi level. Another way of defining the Fermi level is a level beyond which no levels exist, beyond which no field levels exist. So with this second definition I can place the Fermi level here, I can place it anywhere inside the gap, I can place it even inside the conduction band because above that level no field levels exist on Friday when we do the recitation I will show that for a semiconductor if we, def we can define the Fermi level to exist in the middle of the gap and this level really follows our second definition that is above this level no field levels exist but for a pure semiconductor it's in the middle of the gap all right. Now what happens when you apply an electric field? Suppose the electric field is applied in this direction. And suppose you are at greater than... All right. What happens? If you have an electron inside this electric field, what will happen to its potential energy?
will this electron experience a force yes what is the force on the electron minus e e and how is this related to the potential energy the electrostatic potential energy minus d u x by d x agreed this means e e is d u x by d x and what is the potential energy u x e plus some constant this is the potential energy of the electron when it is placed inside an electric field now if the electric field this is the positive direction of x if this is the direction of the electric field x and I plot the potential energy here for the electron as x goes up the potential energy goes up so as x goes up the potential energy goes up and this is just the constant this one it's arbitrary so as x increases the potential energy increases which means that if I have an intrinsic semiconductor a chip of silicon and an electric field is imposed on it that is an electric field is imposed which means that this side is positively charged and this side is negatively charged you place the chip inside a capacitor this is the direction of the electric field and an electron as it goes from the left side to the right side its potential energy goes up which means that if an electron migrates from the left side to the right side it has to overcome the increase in potential energy work is done work is expended if an electron goes from the right side to the left side it does external work and one has to supply external work if an electron has to go from the left to the right because its potential energy is increasing so we know that if you have a potential difference delta V the work that is done in moving a charge across this potential difference is given by what's the work done if the potential difference delta V is E times delta V is the work done in semiconductors we have an analogous situation E times uh, the work done is just the change in the electrostatic potential energy and it is called the change in the Fermi energy let me explain this now the electrons energy increases as X increases which means that when this semiconductor is placed inside an electric field the bands they bend so you place the semiconductor inside a field the new band diagram will look as follows <coughs> this gap remains eg the Fermi level which is in the middle remains in the middle of this gap EF and the bands slope 
and the slope of these bands is the same as the slope of this potential energy function. Now which direction is the electron moving in? The electron is moving in the left direction because the electric field is in the right direction. So this direction is the direction of increasing x. If I have an electron in the conduction band which has been generated by electron hole pair generation this electron is in the conduction band when you provide it what will happen is that it will move in this direction so it will go to the next level when it's moving in this direction and then it will lose its energy by scattering come here and then it will move in this direction gain energy again so this is how conduction takes place inside a, a semiconductor when it is placed inside an electric field. In other words, if you place the semiconductor inside an electric field, the Fermi level slopes. And this change in Fermi level, delta EF, as you go from one end of the semiconductor to the other end of the semiconductor, represents the work that is done by the electron. The work that is supplied by the electron or the work that has to be supplied to the electron. And this electron is traversing these sloping bands in this way. And the electron is moving from a point of higher Fermi energy to a point of lower Fermi energy. And the change in Fermi energy as it moves across the sample is delta EF. And this is the work done by the electron. Likewise, a hole moves in exactly the opposite sense. A hole moves like this then it goes like this, like this, like this sorry so a hole moves uphill an electron moves downhill it moves from a region of higher Fermi level to a region of lower Fermi level whereas a hole moves from a region of lower Fermi level to a higher Fermi level because they are oppositely charged and in fact I will request Dr. Rabdi to build upon this concept further and what the next lecture will be aimed as what happens when a p-type material is connected to an n-type material and a diode is formed and on Friday we will look at this again in more detail and I will repeat most of the things that I've described today. Thank you very much. <coughs>